This is great. So this is a real this is a real attack, actual attack, yeah, from the wild. Is that right? It is, yeah. So this is an example of a trace file that was taken. Okay, no, during... let, let, let's start. Let's start. No, no, I must do this properly. Sorry. I know how to love you now. Hey everyone, really excited that Chris is going to share some real world hacking stuff with us in this video. Chris, I don't want to, you know, spoil it. Tell us, tell us what you got and tell us what you're going to show us. All right, David, sounds good. Uh, and I'm excited to be back. I'm excited to be here with you. Actually, this is a really interesting trace file that I wanted to show everybody because it's an example of an actual attack. Yeah. Okay, so um, really we could think red team or actually we're going to go to a bit of our blue team hat here as we're, if we were observing this and it helps us to learn how it actually happens and then how to analyze it in Wireshark, right? So this is going back into the theme about something that you had talked about on a previous video is how important it is for us to understand as hackers or blue teamers, we got to understand TCP. You know, I mean, these are systems that are being accessed over the TCP protocol. Right. So something that I spent a fair amount of time doing is looking at TCP flows and just looking for weirdness. Now, the good thing is that the people can follow along. So I think we've linked the uh, down in the description. They can actually download and follow along with me in this PCAP. So feel free to go get that trace file, pull it down, open it up in Wireshark. And I'm going to just show you guys some interesting things that jump out to me. And hopefully that'll help them get more out of the, the Wireshark. Yeah, I'm going to try. I'm going to try and shut up because last time I asked so many questions. So those of you who are watching, let us know. Do you prefer it when I ask Chris a bunch of questions or do you prefer just getting to it? So let us know in the comments. Chris, I'm going to keep quiet. Show us, show us what you got. No worries. OK, so first, I just want to credit my friend Jasper Bungertz and he's in uh, Germany. He sent me this PCAP. Uh, said, use it, it's a good demonstration. So I just wanna thank him for that. Um, so basically this was a real attack that was coming in. Now, if we open this up in Wireshark, first of all, uh, I, I, I have my default profile over here, off and to the right. Um, now, I've got several profiles here, but most people, if you open it up and you see default down here, you're gonna see a screen that looks similar to mine. Now, real quick sidebar, David. All right, so a profile. All that is, is it's a, a set of settings in Wireshark that make things look different. So I can change coloring rules. I can change uh, filters that are at the at the ready. Uh, there's dissectors that I can add and remove. So in this, this, is, this should be the way that it looks for everybody um, in this um, in, in this PCAP. I'll show you, I'm gonna switch to another one in just a minute, just to show you how it can look different and how you can build it uh, in your own copy of Wireshark. So what we first see, now no doubt you noticed this as well, David, I see just IPs jumping all over the place, right? So so that looks interesting. I also see the destination IP. Uh, okay, I see a, a few different ones. I can see that over here, right away, my eye catches port 80. I, see, right? I, so I, I was going to say, I see a lot of source ports going to the same port 80, which might be normal, but it's a bunch of sins, isn't it? Sure is, exactly. So just from this view, you, you did it, you caught it well. There, there's either a bunch of people from all over the world are coming into port 80, or this is some kind of attack, right? And if we look at the client side ephemeral port, uh, this one, although it doesn't jump around all over the place, it does kind of stay in a range. You notice that? Yeah. 17,000, 17,000, that catches my eye. But a big one is over here. Look at our time. From the time we start our point of capture, if we go forward in time, we're still under, this, this is microseconds. Right, so these are just flying into our, our point of capture. This is coming in quick. Now, here's where it gets fun. If I just sort through, I, I really, um, I wanted to leave this as just a simple and clear trace file for you guys. There's not a ton of packets here. We're talking about 6,000 packets. A lot of times we start Wireshark and we're dealing with you know hundreds of thousands within a pretty quick amount of time. But here, if we start to look down, one thing, there's a, a feature with Wireshark that I have configured that I wanted to make sure everybody knew how to do. I'm just going to pick a packet, literally this one. And let's go ahead and come down just to take a look at some things that might look pretty interesting or, or obscure here. Uh, I'm going to open up IP first. All right, so let me just scroll this up. All right, IP. So right away, I actually have a, a feature that's configured in Wireshark and it's called GOIP. That looks a bit strange, but yeah, tell us how you got that. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so down in the description below, uh, we have a link to, uh, there's a site called MaxMind. 
and MaxMind keeps uh, basically a repository of IPs to uh, like what you would find if you're going to do like a Whois lookup. Yeah. Like the general information, like where is it coming from? So city, country, uh, ASN number. And then when we take those databases and we put them into Wireshark, we can actually see this stuff. So I'm going to show you how to do that. Uh, so right here, I can see that this specific SIN is coming from the UK. It wasn't me. Uh, I don't know about that. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, it's funny that I happened to pick that one. I wonder, you know, that's an interesting one that I happened to grab. But it also gives us a, a guesstimated GOIP uh, latitude longitude. Okay. But let's check this out. Now I'm just going to take my country... I am going to show you how to configure this, David. Give me give me one second, though. Let me right-click this guy, and I'm just going to do out and apply his column. All right. So now let's check out the countries that we see stuff coming in from. And let's just see if any of them look interesting that I need to dig into. First of all, I don't have a whole lot of customers in Turkey. You know, I'm in San Diego, United States. So that's kind of interesting. That jumps out at me. Japan, uh, I got from China. We got, uh, boy... We got a bunch of U.S. stuff, again, U.K. In fact, something that's kind of interesting that I can do with uh, the GOIP settings, I can come up to statistics and I can go to endpoints in Wireshark. Okay, so now that I have that actually enabled, the naming, um, if I come over to IP, first of all, I can see that there's a ton of IP conversations in this trace file, right? It's not like just one machine talking to another machine. I see almost 6,000 unique IP conversations, and most of them have just one packet on them. And that's the sin that we were talking about. Yeah. Well, if I, if I come down here, let me just scroll down. All right, this is where I start to see that, uh, that, that country, city, autonomous system number, AS organization information. So this is where I can just sort on country and I can just take a walk. Let me uh, do that. Let me just sort on country. And I'm just gonna start to scroll down and then I can start to see all the different countries I have, Canada, all the above. Well, wouldn't it be kind of cool to put that on a map, David? What do you think? Yeah, it'd make it easier. That'd be pretty sweet, right? Yeah. So let's, let's do this. If I come down to map and I could just go to open in browser. So what Wireshark does is it basically That's takes awesome. that database of GYPs. The database itself is static. I'm going to talk to you about that in just a minute. Um, just a few minutes, I'm going to show you how to do this because I know everyone's thinking, how do I do that with Wireshark? But so basically, so first I have to be able to have Wireshark do a lookup of an IP to a record that allows it to name it. And then after that, it then can throw it out there to just our browser. It brings up, in my case, brought up Chrome. It'll throw pins on all the different locations that we saw on the other um, screen. Now, something that's kind of interesting here is I can click on one of these guys and then it can fan out this cool little star thing. And then I can take a look at the individual IPs that are coming in. You've got to show us how to do this. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I was just, I was just baiting you there, right? Oh, I see you baiting so, us. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Go, go for it. Right. Sorry. No problem. No problem. Okay. So here's a question, David. I, Okay, so if I'm just coming into packet analysis, I'm just learning how to hack. I'm just learning how TCP works. Does this look normal and healthy to you? No. Right. Which exactly. country, which country is that? The three sixty nine is that Russia or was that? This was Russia. This is this is coming in from. Yeah. No, so so I know we've got an audience from right around the world. So I don't want to pick on any individual country, but I mean you had what India, China, um, Russia. Um, there's certain countries that have a lot. I mean, the, for me, the biggest giveaway is the sins, and there's like one packet, one packet. Absolutely, yeah, and and well said. I mean, hey, I got more coming in from my neck of the woods than anywhere else. Right? Right, so we so, must blame the U.S. for all our problems, yeah. Exactly. There we go. <laughs> all right. It's a it's a joke. It's a joke for anyone who's like getting you know upset. I think I think all of us would agree. While okay, we, it, you're right. We're not going to pick on anyone in the country, but is it likely that I have customers coming in from? all these different places and especially at this these, these this rate right i'm just not going to see this many connections coming in from all over the place and uh you know i mean if i zoom in real close to i actually think that david from his house he said oxford right yeah all right so that's, that's me that's, that's david. me yeah, so, so in one of David's hacking videos that he was t showing everybody how to do, who knows, maybe we caught him. We caught him in the act. We just don't know. <laughs> so then the, the big question is, right, how do I do this? This would be a pretty useful feature to have in Wireshark. 
And I'm going to go right back over everything that I just showed you, but now I'm going to show you how to do it. What do you think? Yeah, it'd be great. Okay. So f the first thing, uh, key to doing this is naming rules. And uh, what we can do as well down below, David, is we can link, there's a video that I have over on my channel, and it shows you a real deep dive step by step on the name resolution features. That'd be great, yeah. So, so to not go into those weeds here, we just want to get to that GOIP. Um, there is a link below to go out to MaxMind. You have to go out to MaxMind and you have to register for a free account. It's free. You can just download the city, country, and autonomous system databases. And the link shows you how to do that. Those are three files. They're MaxMind database files, MMDB. Once you have those local on your system, what we have to do is we have to point Wireshark to them. So how do I do that? Well, I'm going to come up here to Wireshark. If I'm on a Mac system, I go to Wireshark Preferences. If I'm on Kali, Windows, any other type of lin uh, Linux install, I'm going to do that under Edit Preferences. Okay, that's where I'm going to go. So let's go Preferences. And what we're going to do is go to Name Resolution. We tinkered in this a little bit on our last video. But basically, what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come Name Resolution, then come down to this is the key, MaxMind database directories. I'm just going to hit edit. And the three database files that you download out there at MaxMind, you're going to put those into a folder. And all you do is point Wireshark to that folder. All right, you're going to have three little dots. You can bring it up and say, hey, Wireshark, go get your, your files are over here in this folder. So now, hey, Wireshark, when you see this an IP address, you now have, have now have a local database to compare it to. And the MaxMind like link that you use is, is just built into Wireshark, yeah? Yeah, correct. So well, we, we, we have to link, the link that we shared is to go out and download them separately. Yeah, and then you just point, Once, you just point Wireshark to it basically, yep. That's it. That's correct. Now, there is something to be said about that. It's a static database, Yeah. right? So is this bleeding edge, cutting edge, the latest of yesterday's information, no. However, uh, is it? can I take it with a grain of salt? Sure, right? So so that's just a caveat right there. Uh, yeah, but, but, if, but it's not like totally out of date, is it? I mean, it's fairly recent. No. Yeah. I think this one, this one's actually from September, 2021. So that's it's good only enough. a couple months I mean, old. that's good enough for us. It is for me too, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm happy with that. Okay, so that was a cool feature that I just wanted to make sure everybody is aware of that on Wireshark especially as either hackers, blue teamers, any kind of thing in security, it's nice to be able to have the GOIP stuff. It is. Another thing that's nice with this is I start to look around at the uh, different countries, country codes. See, these are things that I can start to build filters for. And I could even have Wireshark call it out if it sees a certain code that from my perspective might look suspect, right? So let's see how to do that. Uh, let's take a look. Let's, I'm just going to, I'm not, okay, UK. Let's pick on you, David. All right. Yeah. I want to see anything uh, coming in. Only the dodgy people live in the UK. Is that right? So you don't have customers in the UK, something like that. You know, your audio is a little, a little fuzzy. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I don't know if I heard that question right, but um, anyway, so, so UK. All right. Let's, let's just take a look at what some of the things we could do with this. So first of all, if I come down now, um, notice as well, my source address, I have source GYP but I'm not gonna have GOIP for my destination, right? So anything that's in our private address space, 10.172.16.192.168, uh, those address ranges are not gonna have an associated lookup, okay? So just a, just a buyer beware thing. All right, so let's, let's have some fun with the country code. I'm gonna go ahead and right click this guy, and I'm just gonna say prepare as filter, and I'm gonna say selected. Okay, so right up here, I have country, and then it's our country abbreviation, Great Britain. So let's just apply that. And now this is gonna show me everything coming in from that country code. Right away, I can see I got 736 packets coming in from Great Britain. I don't know about you, David, do you like typing out the long syntax in Wireshark of all these filters? No, no. I mean, it's it's so much easier the way that you're doing it, where you just select stuff. So much easier. Absolutely. So let's do this. I never want to have to type that out. In fact, I don't want to have to right click and do a filter thing like that again. So I can come up here to the right, the top right, and I can add this as a button. So I can just say uh, GB. Okay. 
or from from GB. All right, cool. Now, with a few tweaks, I can also make it to where I can throw a few other country codes at this. So not just Great Britain. What if I wanted to see everything coming in from Great Britain, China, uh, Japan? I'm just throwing out three countries for grins. If I come in here, what I can do is I can use something called an incl includes or an in filter. I'm just going to throw a bracket on this guy. So now I can just do a list. This is a little uh, complicated, but if we zoom in a little, little bit there. So GB, uh, I can do CN is the China country code. How about RU and then uh, Japan just for, just for fun. So now this filter is going to show me anything coming from any of those areas. Yeah. I can enter that my display just went up to 1500. Now let's do, let's take this one step further. What if we could make it to where Wireshark could throw those country codes up in red, in bright red, like mayday, mayday, I, this is something wrong. Focus on this. Let's give that a shot. Let's go ahead and first of all, I'm just gonna say, I'm just gonna use the word suspect codes just for this is going to be in a security profile. By the way, most of the time, everybody heads up, I'm doing this in a different profile and I'm saving all of this off. But for now, just learning how to do it, we can stay in the default profile for now. Okay, I'm just going to take this guy and I'm going to copy it. Okay, I just did my little uh, control copy. And next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here to view and I want to come down here to coloring rules. Everybody can join me there. View, coloring rules. The way that coloring rules work in Wireshark is basically, this is a list of prioritization from top to bottom. And as a packet meets a filter, then it's going to be colored according to whatever that color is. All right, so what I wanna do is I'm just gonna say plus. And I'm just gonna say, my filter is gonna be the one I just cut and pasted. And now I can say suspect country codes. Look at that, I can type. Okay, so <laughs> if I uh, select that, so so right away, if I if I leave this by itself, then all of those, and I, I would have to apply it here, um, all of these are just going to be white lines with black letters, right? That's not going to jump out to me too much. Instead, I wanted to go to the background. Instead of white, I'm going to bring up, oh, sometimes this happens. It comes up behind the little box. There we go. Here's my colors. And how about bright red? What do you think, David? Yeah. Let's make that guy just jump. Would that jump at you? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, the, the problem is it's all going to be red, but I, I can see what, where you're going with this. It's great, yeah. All right, let's say, okay. I'm just going to run this back through, cycle back through, cool. All right, so here, all of these are now going to be red, but let's go ahead and do this. Let's pull off our filter now, Yeah. okay? So now, if That's I nice. wanted to see, here's, and I can look over here at the side. If I had this much suspect stuff coming into my network, that could raise an alarm, right? I, I would hope my IDS would catch something like this. But as analysts, uh, even as uh, pen testers, even as attackers, we want to be able to know how this works and that this type of thing is possible, especially at the packet level. So right over here with my intelligent scroll bar, you can see all the red lines. Now I know just with a glance over here to the side, oh, I got a bunch of red. I got stuff coming in. This is not okay. So let me just back up and review. We loaded up the GOIP databases. We were able to take a look at the endpoints menu. If I come up to statistics endpoints, and I was able to go down to the bottom and put all of this on a map. And then we were able to build some filters that specifically identify specific country codes coming in that would be suspect to me, depending on where I am in the world. And then we were able to take those country codes and put a coloring filter on them. So that's, that's something that could be uh, a useful as I'm doing my analysis. Now, I, I wanted to point out to you as well, David, there's a few other things that are just weird about this scan that as an analyst would jump out at me, even if I didn't have any of these coloring rules, which in fact, just for, uh, just for grins, I think what I'm gonna do, let me switch over to a different profile. I'm gonna go to my security profile. And you're gonna notice that it just happens to be in this profile. All of my TCP sins are always green. Why? I like them to jump out in a positive way. This is the start of a new TCP conversation. Uh, you can see in this profile, I do have a few suspect country codes coming in. But let's go ahead and take a look at, if I take a look at just this first one, 
Now, as an analyst, I, I, I do look at TCP quite a bit. I, I was just going to say, like on your, on the right hand side where you've got that like summary view, there's so much green. Like you were showing the red yeah. of the country code, you can see there's a, so many sins there, isn't it? It's almost all sins just by looking at your summary. Yeah. Oh, that's great with the colors. Absolutely. Sorry, go on. So now for me, because I'm used to it, and thanks for interjecting that, because because I'm used to it, now I can just glance over at that scroll bar and I see, oh, boom, a bunch of green. I got a bunch of sins. But here's where the analysis comes in, David. Are these real, honest people that are just coming in and hopefully passing by my my web server and, uh, you know, I either, boom, got a lot of interest all over the world in my company, or this could be some kind of attack. Now, already we've agreed, okay, this is a lot, but what if it just happens to be that from a lot of different areas? How would we know? What is it about these sins that should call our attention? So I'm going to go ahead and take a look at the first one. All right, so first one's coming in, and I'm going to go ahead and come to... First of all, our country is, is suspect there. And then if I open up TCP and there's a few things that happen here. First of all, where my eye goes for me as an analyst is my sequence number. Sequence number is 34796. Now, on its own, we might be thinking, uh, how, how, I mean, okay, what's what looks weird about that? Well, if I come over here to the side, if I look at my hexadecimal view, this is a four byte value. It's called the ISN, initial sequence number. When I first start a TCP handshake, I send you, David, a SIN, and I let you know a sequence number that I'm going to start at. Sequence analysis is a whole different topic we'll get into. But the point is I'm offering, here's my starting sequence number value. Now, why is that suspect? Well, it's a low number. A lot of times when we're doing operating system enumeration, I don't want to figure out, okay, is this a Linux box I'm talking to? I'm sure many people have done an Nmap OS fingerprinting. A lot of times, this is one of the values that Nmap looks at to try to figure out what the operating system is, right? What is the starting range of sequence number that is offered by TCP? Now, this is a pretty low number. In fact, my eye is just going to stay down here. And if I just start to scroll through these, you notice Right there, I'm just toggling between packet one and two. The odds of that sequence number being that close are pretty low. 34,000, 25,000. Usually this number is up in the billions. <laughs> I was going to ask you, because you, you know, you've, had so, you've got so much experience looking at this stuff. What's like normal? So it's, you're saying it's very high numbers, yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're, you're in the billions. And it's a four byte value. So the number itself doesn't really matter. It's just that I'm just telling you, hey, David, I'm going to count to 100, but I'm going to start counting from 34,000. Right? That, that's all this number means. But it's very unusual that you would have it, so many sins coming in from allegedly so many different places that are this close. Right? So that's suspect. Um, also, if I keep coming down here in the TCP header, uh, if I come down to header length is 20 bytes, that is very unusual for a sin. And let me tell you why. Okay, so the, the base header, the base values of TCP, if we do not have any options, any extra cool bells and whistles, um, anyone who stopped by my channel knows about SAC and uh, retransmission blocks that can be pointed out by selective acknowledgement. Uh, we can have things like MSS and SINs. Um, window scale factors, it gets, it gets, gets hairy, right? But there's, there's a lot of options that can go into a TCP SYN. I tell you, hey, David, I want to connect to you. Here's the TCP options that I would like to take advantage of. Well, in order to send you those options in my SYN, I have to have a header that's longer than 20 bytes. If you look at any other SYN, go ahead and capture one, everybody. Just open up Wireshark, capture a TCP SYN, and you're going to see this is usually 32, uh, 40, 44. It just depends on how many um, options I'm offering to you. But never do you see it anymore at 20 bytes because we don't have any TCP options at all in this TCP SYN. What that tells me is that whoever sent this or whatever sent this doesn't want to offer a bunch of neat TCP modern bells and whistles. This is like a very base level, I don't want to be overly committed here, sin that absolutely catches my attention because normal standard healthy stacks these days are going to have options right tcp was written back in i mean the rfc goes back to the early 80s 
TCP has had a lot of options that have made it more um, uh, efficient in our time. And uh, that's why it's lasted for 40 years. But those options are key to that. So to have all these sins and not have any options, not good. In fact, if I come up here to my TCP filters, these are all the filters I've built in my, TC, my, uh, my uh, security profile. Uh, this is something that over time, this is just to bait everybody, we're going to start talking about this security profile and we're going to be going through and I'm going to show you examples that and why I built all these filters. But one that I built just yesterday for this was sin with no options. So this is a filter. It's tcp.flags.sin equals one. So show me a packet that has a sin, but show me only the ones that do not have any option flags. So what we see here is basically, this is what we can conclude so far. These aren't real sins from honest customers that are coming in uh, from all over the world that just wanna buy that new David Bumble book. <laughs> Instead, this, because of the behavior, this is a, a sin that doesn't wanna be overly committed. There's no, there's no options. There's no um, extra bells and whistles to these, this TCP stack. Also, it's coming in from so many different places. And these sequence numbers don't look like normal, healthy uh, starting values. So when we put all of that together, we can see that this is not, uh, this is not normal. So what is this? Well, likely this is a bot army out there that's doing a DDoS attack on somebody. The, the bot army or someone is spoofing their their IP address and allegedly coming in from a lot of different places, but they're just coming in from one location. I'm about to show you how we could determine that. This is great. I mean, so the, um, what about the window size? That's something that seems consistent. Is that is that normal or is that weird? Let's go ahead and take a look at a packet and I wanna come down to uh, in TCP, really uh, all TCP packets are gonna have that uh, receive window. Uh, this window size, David, you were mentioning? Yeah, yeah. They're all 16384. Or most yeah, of them are, okay, most good of call. them are, yeah. Good call, yeah. And we can see that here, or like, like you did as well. You could also see it over here in the info. Yeah, again, let's go back to likelihood. Is it likely that real users, real devices from all of these different locations would come in with the exact same window starting value? Uh, suspect, right? Yes, yeah, so, so in the real world, if it was normal traffic, you'd see all kinds of window sizes, is that right? Yeah, you'll see them from all different uh, types of, uh, browsers, operating systems. Um, and really, you're typically not going to see it start this low. Remember, um, a, a window size, and uh, maybe we can link the dis in the description. I have a whole video that breaks this down and, and how, to, how to use this value. But basically, this is just saying, it, hey, David, in this connection, you cannot send me any more than 16K at once. This is a, an initial getting started window size. Now I can adjust that window, I can multiply it, it can be much larger. But a lot of times when we're starting that connection, we'll be a bit more committed than 16K. Like how about 65? <laughs> I mean, it's a two byte value. The, the, the number itself cannot be any larger than 65,535 because it's only two bytes. That's not a lot of receive window buffer space. So that's why we have uh, options that allow us to make it much larger. However, that was a really good spot for you because it's just, again, back to odds of likeliness. It's very unlikely that this, I would have a bunch of legit connections coming in that's using exactly the same window size. So it's so a good catch, David. And the sequence numbers are all zeros. What's the likelihood of that? That's also weird, isn't it? So the sequence number, is actually, this is showing us our relative sequence number. So if I come down here, you see relative sequence number? Yeah. And then the sequence number raw? Yeah. So the true value itself is 65813, but basically Wireshark's saying, Ugh, that's a large number. You know what, you humans, you humans are so simple. You <laughs> always need to start counting from zero. Like if I told you, hey, David, count to 10, you'd go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Yeah. But if I said, no, I want you to count to 10, but I want you to start counting from the value of 1,777,364. Yeah. And then I want you to go up 10 values. Eh, we have a harder time with that as humans. So what Wireshark does is like, hey, look, I'll do you a solid here. Let me just zero this number out 
And so that that'll now be a relative sequence number throughout the life of this connection. So good spot, sequence number is zero. However, usually that's gonna be the case only because Wireshark does that solid for us. It says, here, I'll zero it out for you. Another thing that's weird, let me come up here and I want to go to IP. Now let's go back into our networking roots, right? Um, I wanna come down to time to live. All right, so this value is also gonna be interesting for me. In fact, uh, I'm just it's so interesting. I'm just going to right click and I'm going to throw it up there as a column. Okay, so now time to live. Now time to live is I use this field a lot. And basically what this does is it gives me a guess as to how far away the sender is that actually sent this in. Now time to live. That's something that we've seen before in our careers. Um, anybody that's studying for a Cisco cert or is in networking, uh, time to live is a value you use. I mean, think about it. When you send a ping, right? We, we send out that ping and get that ping response. We get information back from the other side. We get reply. We get the length. What was the length of the payload? But in every ping we've ever sent, we also have the receive TTL from the other side, the, the TTL that we receive from the other side. Oh yeah, I mean that's how we can use trace rot to to discover rot and stuff. Yeah, so it's used all over the place. But the big question is, is that normal? Good question. Exactly. So coming here to TTL, yeah. So so this number had to start at something, right? And it, and it was decremented every router on its path back to me. One two three sounds so when very I see, very very normal, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, one twenty three. So what that tells me in my I put on my analyst hat. There's really only three normal healthy numbers that TTL will start at usually in most cases. Okay, think the general ninety five percent of the things out there. Yeah, they're either going to start at sixty four, one twenty eight, or one or two fifty five. Those yeah. bit boundary numbers, 64, yeah. 128, 255. This number no, number never goes up. It always goes down. So what I can assume is that this device started, it couldn't can't be 64 because this number can't go up. It's likely not 255 because that would be a pretty crummy route that would go from 255 all the way down to me receiving it at 123. So here I can guess that this station started at 128. This guy's likely five hops away from me or acting like he's five hops away from me. Yeah. And then I can just let my eyes go. This is 10 hops away, five hops away, 17 hops away. This probably started at 255. So what I'm going to start to do now, David, is I'm going to start to look to see if I have a pattern. It looks like I have a station that's five hops away, one that's 10 hops away. If these are real, it's possible they're spoofed. But those are one of the indicators I'm going to look at. Uh, 105, so if, if this was routed properly, okay, this was 23 hops away. Okay, so I, I start to see that I have stations that seem to be coming in from different hop counts away from me. All right, so now this starts to tell me that this is likely not one station that's DDoSing me, or it's also spoofing the TTL. But likely what happened was the instruction went out to the bot army. The bot army starts to do the DDoS attack. And this is coming in from all of those infected machines from wherever they're at. Yeah, I mean, you can see a pattern in those TTLs, can't you? So that looks suspect as well. Absolutely. So that, that'd be another piece of information that I'd be interested in seeing in Wireshark. This is great. So let's back up and think about what we learned. So just, I, just, I just wanted, before you jump to that, sorry, I just wanted to ask you, Chris, the TTLs, in the real world, because you've done so many of these packet scans um, or packet captures, sorry, is it all kind of like random or do you see patterns like this or does this TTL like immediately raise a flag to you that this is, uh, this is not normal? It's a good question. Um, so for me, it raises a flag in that I, I have a pretty good case to build that this is not a single station that's spoofing all of these IPs. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, if you, I mean, now it is possible that the device is faking them. That's absolutely true. That's a possibility. However, one thing that I would just quickly check, what I'm looking for is uh, the value itself in what it, in what it represents isn't as important. What if these were all one route or even how about non-routed TTLs? What if all of these came in from 128s or 255s? Yeah. Well, what that means is if you and I are in the same company, you're my buddy in a cubicle over, you're the one that's starting the DDoS. Yeah. Now I can go and look at my MAC addresses, go to Ethernet, 
and I come here and I see David's uh, David is the source Mac and I can go, whoa, these are non-routed packets. The IPs themselves are being spoofed. We've got some weird uh, sequence numbers, but the TTL is unrouted. This never passed through a router. That means it's local. It's coming from in my house. So that's what I would be looking for. That would be very, then that's when everyone, my eyes would go wide open and we'd start to go look to see who's doing this. As far as healthy goes, um, are these normal values? Uh, in of of themselves, it's normal to see ingress traffic in these ranges. What's abnormal to me is I don't see any that are in the 64 range and I don't see a whole lot that are up in the 255 range. So this was one station, or not one station, one type of device. Maybe um, maybe the bot was infecting only a certain type of operating system that happened to be starting from 128 all the time. That's one thing that Nmap looks for as well when we're doing OS enumeration or we're looking at OS fingerprinting. Nmap will say, okay, here's a TCP SYN. I'm more interested in what's your TTL, what's your starting TTL, and what's your starting sequence number. Then I can begin to fingerprint you. But yeah, it's... um. Uh, it's just abnormal to see this many sins. I do have somewhat of a pattern of the TTL, and I don't see this range jump to 64 or 255. It's kind of in a in a in a band, if you will. The the, the thing is, you look at so many packets, you you have a gut feel for what you know what's right and what's wrong. So it's great to get kind of like, you know, if I don't have the same experience as you, how do I kind of like see through all the noise? and kind of know what's fake. So this is brilliant, thanks. It, that's exactly the reason why, David, I didn't want to give you, I, I could have given you guys you know, a gig trace and said, all right, let's go find the weird sins. But the problem is with that is that then we have so much static. Yeah, We're gonna see ARPs and STPs and we're gonna see a bunch of healthy traffic along with bad. So now when we have bad, what we can start to do is we can start to build our filters, weird country codes, strange TTLs, um, and then yeah, low sequence numbers, for example. We can save all of those guys up here in our profile. And then when I do have that 10 gig trace file, I just come up here and I say, all right, show me all the sins with no options. And then boom, I can have my bad packets because I built that filter ahead of time. So hopefully this gave everybody a bit more hands-on with uh, an actual scan. Um, how it feels when, you know, you, you, that's what I want people to start to get more comfortable with. And then you'll start to develop that kind of sixth sense. Like, yeah, maybe I don't know exactly what is happening, but the picture that I'm seeing on this screen looks weird. And this is why. Yeah. If people, people start to develop that, uh, the rest in time, as you, as you see it more and more often, you'll be faster to identify that strange behavior. So Chris, I really want to thank you for sharing this. Um, the question is always, where can I learn more? So can you tell us, have you got courses? Um, have you got content on your channel and stuff? That, you know, Specifically for like red team hacking type content, where, where can we learn more about this weirdness? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely, David. So if people stop by my channel, I have very TCP specific content out there that shows you what all of these different values mean and how to interpret them. Uh, a lot of those videos have a trace file just like this video has where you can download it and you can follow along. Uh, and I even have a Wireshark mini series out there. Um, also on a lot of my videos, you're gonna go down to the description and you're gonna see that I have some Pluralsight content out there. So uh, Pluralsight, it's an online IT training platform. So if you wanna go into a deeper dive into TCP and also identifying attacks like this one, uh, think blue team, but also as a pen tester, it's good to know how these things would work as well or as a, as a hacker. So uh, with those courses, I have configuring Wireshark for cybersecurity analysis and also doing some identify cyber attacks like this one with Wireshark. And again, that's all hands-on. I'm very hands-on driven. Uh, I, I don't know about the viewers. I, I have a tough time just reading through a thousand page book. I, instead, I like to give you a PCAP get your hands on it and help you build your profiles and filters and then giving you that comfort with Wireshark. Oh, that's brilliant. So I'll put some links below as well. What are you gonna tease us with for next time? All right, what do you think if we went down the signature path? Or we also have a, I have another uh, a PCAP. We didn't wanna cram too much into this one, but also about how an Nmap scan works and what to look for if someone, what if someone was Nmapping you? <laughs>
Yeah, let's do I, I want, I, want, that? I think Nmap. So, I mean, please vote below. Um, would you like OS signatures or Nmap? I think we should do both. Um, maybe my, I'd vote for Nmap and then we can do signatures after that, Chris. But, you know, Sounds thanks. Good. Thanks so much for sharing your knowledge. Oh, you bet, David. It's been great to be here. Thanks for having me.